Good morning, Redemption family. Good morning, Redemption. Hi, Redemption. Good morning. Hi. We miss you. We all love you. We love you guys and we miss you. We just want to say that we miss and love each one of y'all. Um, we can't wait to worship together in person. We are so excited to worship with you and hear God's word. Are you excited? Yes. Y'all have anything you want to say? Have um, a good day. Yeah. Have a good day too. Have a great day. We love you guys. Bye. 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 Good morning, Redemption. Welcome to another Sunday of online and in-home worship. I just want to say at the beginning today, I miss you. And all the, the rest of the church, I think we have this sense of just missing one another. But even in, the, uh, in, in our sadness of not seeing one another, of not being able to give a hug or a handshake, that's not going to stop our, our worship this morning, is it? So at Redemption, we're a vertical church, and so we want to set our uh, mind and our attention on the Lord this morning, just like we do every Lord's Day. And so uh, whether we're gathered at our church building, whether we're uh, worshiping online and in home as we are now, we won't let that stop the praise of God's uh, people to the Lord who are gathered together. So I'm excited to worship with you today. I'm excited to sing these songs with you, even though I won't hear your voices. I'm excited to pray these prayers. I'm excited to give to the work of the ministry with you. I'm excited to dig into God's word uh, together with you as we begin this new series called Rock Solid. Hear these uh, words from Psalm uh, 111 to begin our worship today. They say this, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my 
whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Let us do just that. Though the company of the righteous in your congregation may be smaller this morning, let us praise the Lord with great thanksgiving. Would you uh, stand up with me now there in your home and let's uh, sing these songs of faith to the Lord.
Okay, church, go ahead and uh, be seated for uh, our time as we worship through prayer and giving. Let's continue in Psalm 111 to focus our prayers and our giving now. It's, they say this, Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Would you pray with me now? God in heaven, we just uh, stop now full of gratitude, full of uh, awe at who you are. God, you are gracious and merciful. You have caused your works to be remembered. You've given us your word. And for that, this morning, we're thankful. We're thankful that your word is not quarantined, that your word isn't bound up, but it is uh, still going forward in grace and truth. God, thank you that you've used us to, to uh, advance that mission. Thank you that you've used our, us in, in that uh, process. You didn't have to, but you are through uh, our gifts and through our service, through the communication of the gospel and through our giving God. We give you thanks this morning. You've provided every day uh, for us. We wouldn't be here right now, God, if you uh, weren't good, if you weren't merciful, if you weren't providing for us. And so today, God, we are just grateful. We're grateful to be saved. We're grateful that we can stand in Christ today. We're grateful that we have hope. Would you uh, bless now, God, our church, wherever they might be today, would you God, give them a sense of, of just how good you are? Would you uh, return to them the joy of their salvation? Would you, would you be with uh, the believers that are scattered across our city, that are scattered across our state, or around the world this morning, each of us living through these, uh, these crazy times? But God, would you give them encouragement today from your word? Would they know that it is you who are good and true and right? So Father, would you, uh, even now, as we, as we give to you, so we give digitally. We want to see that your wondrous works be remembered for all time. We want to see that, uh, that your uh, gospel, your truth will continue to advance even in these days. So would you be blessed as we uh, give to you this morning, God? Would you be glorified? Would you take these gifts, God, that we give in faith? God, we, there's, we've felt very acutely that uh, you know, our next paycheck may not be promised. And so we give in full faith today, trusting you, God, to take care of our needs. 
to take care of our church's needs, to take care of the needs of your people all across the globe. God, thank you for letting us be a part in both the giving and the receiving of your kindness this morning. I pray these things now in Christ's name. God's people said, amen. Amen. Church, again, thank you. Uh, week after week, you uh, continue to support the work of the ministry, and for that, we are so grateful. Thank you for uh, giving, even again this morning. There's two ways. You can give uh, online at our website at redemption.bible slash give, or you can uh, give uh, through our text to give number. That's 830-266-7333. And you can text a gift of any amount, and it will go to supporting the work of the ministry here at Redemption. Turn in your copy of God's Word now to James 1, verse 5. This is the first message in our series titled, Rock Solid, Promises to Build Your Life On. You know, we've come to live in an age that has uh, been uh, deemed the information age. We have more content and data and information right at our fingertips uh, just go on your phone and swipe to the right, and news is right there. Your Facebook feed, uh, news sources are so accessible now. It's not uh, that we don't know uh, facts and details. It's not that we lack the information to proceed. We have so much at our fingertips that uh, even a generation ago, a hundred years ago, uh, would have thought uh, unthinkable. You know, it's an information jungle in some ways where the content is thick around us. It closes the path around us, choking the sunlight above us, just as if we were in a jungle with trees and vines and plant life all around us. And if we were in the jungle, we might be asking, well, what are these, uh, which of these vines are harmful? What is poisonous to me? What is going to cut me or stab me? And in the information age, we ask a similar question as we're bombarded by data. What is true? What is helpful? What is right? And the way forward can be uncertain. For the believers, we ask a question like, where is the path of righteousness? What are we to do? And we're experiencing this now as the pandemic surrounds us. We are filled with all kinds of data. We have all kinds of news sources and facts and uh, uh, press releases and studies that are showing this or that. And it's an information jungle. And so and for the Christian... What's the way forward in this jungle? And even broader than that, what's the way forward when things are uncertain, when we find ourselves in a crisis? Well, maybe you've heard a, a Christian say, a pastor say this, or you yourself have said something like this. Well, remember the promises of God to you. Claim the promises of God. Preach the promises of God uh, to yourself and as you've heard that, as somebody's encouraged you that way, maybe you've been thinking this question, well, well what does that even mean? What are they? What, what, what are the promises of God? How do we walk them out? How do we claim them? Well, I don't have time to go into all those details here in this message, but we recorded a podcast just for that. So you can go on. It uh, dropped this past week, and uh, you can listen to uh, uh, Aaron and I talk about, well, what are the promises of God? How do we walk in them? What uh, are they in the scriptures? But uh, for the sake of our time this morning and over the next several weeks, uh, Lord willing, we're going to look at several new promises or New Testament promises to build our life on to, that become the pathway for us uh, in this pandemic, the pathway for us in these uncertain times. And so this morning we begin with James 1 verses 5 through 8. And I want to just put the promise before you here and then you'll see it in the scriptures. So if you're taking notes, here's the nail. Here's our main point and it is this, that God promises wisdom to all who ask for it. Let me say that again. God promises wisdom to all who ask for it. And so why don't you, uh, hopefully you have your Bible open there to James 1. I want to read our verses for us today and you can see it for yourself. Here it is, James 1, beginning in verse 5. It says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God 
who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is God's word for God's people. And now the verses that I just read for you, our passage here breaks uh, nicely into two categories, uh, uh, who we ask and how we ask for it. And it gives us uh, four helpful, uh, 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 helpful four-step process. Let me say it that way, a helpful four-step process for walking in wisdom. That will form our outline today, but it also forms this really helpful four-step process for uh, walking in all the promises of God. A four-step process, and we're going to get there, but, uh, but as we begin, I think it's probably helpful for us to define wisdom. I've just uh, proposed to you that God gives wisdom to all who ask for it, and so what is wisdom? How would you define this? You can just write it down in your notes. Maybe talk with your spouse or your children there. But as you are here, before I tell you my answer, how would you define wisdom this morning? Just take a moment and jot it down. You can text it to me if you want, and, uh, and we'll see if it compares to my answer. But how do you define wisdom? Okay, you got it. You've got your answer. Maybe whatever came to your mind, maybe some of you are a little more articulate and so you're trying to craft it. Well, here's my answer for you. I want to define wisdom and I would define it this way. It's the understanding and application of what is true and right. Let me say that again. It's the understanding and application of what is true and right. You have to know what is true and right and then apply it in your life. To understand it but not apply it into your life is foolishness and to not know what is true and right and just to start doing things is also foolish as well but it's the uh, intersection and two-step process in our life of the understanding and application of what is true and right and I hope it is wisdom that is something that all of us want I hope you want to be wise for the opposite is what the scripture calls foolishness or folly you know, in Proverbs, we're told that uh, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. All of us uh, come in uh, foolish, not knowing and not doing what is true and right. And it is God's grace throughout our life uh, that, uh, uh, that drives that foolishness from us and uh, makes us walk in wisdom. And so I hope that uh, your goal is wisdom. And hopefully nobody's here and like, you know what, actually, I kind of like being a fool. No, we want to be wise. And so since our aim is wisdom and God promises to give it, how do we go about obtaining it? That's the question. And that really leads us here to uh, our scripture and the first point, which is this. Acknowledge your lack. The first in our four-step process, if you're taking notes, is this, to acknowledge your lack. This is where he begins. If any of you lacks wisdom, it's really a hypothetical uh, question here. Well, if you do, and all of us uh, do at some point, we must recognize that we don't have all the answers. We don't always know what to do. We don't always know what is true and right. And it's our circumstances that reveal this to us all the time. We feel inadequate. We, we feel foolish. We feel uh, ignorant. You know, we, um, we, we, we say things and we realize, oh, yeah, I don't know what to do. You know, how many times in, in life, let's say in parenting, have you uh, and your spouse had a face that looked kind of like this? This is a situation that Aaron and I, look at this face. Yeah, we, our, our kids were doing something and, and Alyssa actually captured this photo. We were trying to take some family photos and our kids had run off and they were doing something and we were just like, yeah, I don't know what to do. You, you find yourself in a situation like, God, what is the wise way forward? Maybe you've had a big decision in your life about where you wanted to go to college, whether or not to continue college, whether, uh, whether or not to continue in the major that you're currently in. You've maybe had questions about your job and wondered, well, do I go for this new position? Do I stay in the place that I'm at? Do I look for something else? Maybe you've had uh, uh, questions about your retirement. 
you know, well, how much longer am I going to keep working? Am, uh, am I going to keep working? Is now the time? You know, now we're facing questions and we lack really uh, the wisdom as uh, our nation and our state and our city continue to open up. And we're wondering, well, like, what is the best way forward? How do we open up? Is, what is it that uh, we should do in our business? And, you know, there's all kinds of questions and we lack wisdom in these scenarios. But it is this, it's the trials that expose us. You know, the context is so important here. We just kind of parachuted into the book of James. And I know some of you are very familiar with it. Maybe uh, maybe not so much for others of you. Maybe this is your first time in the book of James. But uh, when it comes to the Bible, we can't just like parachute ourselves in. We can't just take a verse out of context. We have to look there at the surrounding verses. Context is key. Context is king. And so if you just back up here, James, and uh, in verse one, just a little bit of background, he says he's a servant of God and of Christ Jesus what he doesn't tell us in the letter, but we know from history is James is actually one of Jesus's brothers and he was a leader in the early church and uh, he's writing this letter to uh, Jewish believers that have been scattered outside of Jerusalem, who'd been scattered uh, and were being persecuted uh, for their faith, who were being marginalized and oppressed because they claim to follow Christ. And so he begins right in after his greeting, Verse 2, telling them to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What are we in today? We're in a trial. We're in a time uh, of, uh, of a testing of our faith. And Paul's advice, his command, his, uh, uh, his pastoral wisdom for us is to count it joy. Why? He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is a test here for a Christian. We had a great message last week on how these tests, how these trials exposed uh, misplaced identities and idols and provisions and fear and all those things in our life. And this is God's goodness to us. And it's producing this uh, mark of a genuine faith of steadfastness. See, Christians, we don't quit. We don't give up. We don't uh, lose heart. We press on in the power of the Spirit, uh, counting even our trials as joy, knowing that God is doing a good work in us. He is strengthening our faith in the midst of this. And so trials, circumstances, they reveal our lack all the time. They reveal what is missing in our faith, namely wisdom. And so it's in the context of, of trials that uh, then uh, James here tells me, he says, if you lack wisdom, if what is being exposed in your life is that you uh, don't know what is true and right and how to apply it, then it is what we do next that determines if we are indeed wise or foolish. You know, in the midst of trials, when things get tough, we can try to fake it till we make it, right? We can put on a show and we can pretend that we have it all figured out, you know, or we can, we just put our head down and we can try to plow forward, making our own way. We're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be struck down by this. We could curl up in a ball and we can uh, cry uh, on the floor or after acknowledging our lack, here's the second point, we can ask God in faith. Ask God in faith. See, who we ask is so important. We recognize that we don't have it all figured out, and then it goes on here, and it's really, it's, it's actually a command. With the, in our English translation, the blow is softened a little bit by saying, let us ask God. But it's really like, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Ask, just ask God. This is so important. See, why? Because we look to all kinds of things for wisdom. And we can look to other religions. Well, what does, you know, this guru say? What does that guru say? We can, we can look to Mother Earth for our direction. You know, what, is, uh, what, what are our instincts telling us? What are the plants telling us? We can look to uh, behavioral sciences, those sciences that make observations about uh, uh, human behavior. And we can look to, uh, look to those observations as the way of wisdom. 
look to Facebook, news, media, all kinds of outlets and see what so-and-so is saying, what this association is saying, what this uh, bureaucratic agency is saying about things. And we look to all kinds of outside sources for wisdom, but each of them is limited in their power and limited into their finite conclusions. But instead, Christian, church, we're told to ask God and he will give it. And he will give it. Here is the promise. If you ask God, he will give it. And how does he give it? He gives it. Well, look at what it says here. He gives generously to all. I love this that when we ask God, he gives us in abundance. God could never be charged with uh, being miserly of his gifts being meager. He is liberal. He lavishes upon us uh, in wisdom. You know, it's as if we ask uh, God and he just opens up the storehouse for us. It's like if you need a hammer and you go to a friend's house and ask, hey, can I borrow a hammer for this project? And he says, yeah, of course a hammer. And here's the code to my entire tool shed. And he has more tools that, than, uh, than even the hardware store has. And they are all there for your taking. And not only the ability to use them and to have them, but manuals and, and expertise and how to use all the tools. And you just came looking for a hammer. And now he has thrown wide open the doors, giving you full access to every tool, ability to use it day, night, any time you need. Come and give it. Ask God who gives generously and without reproach. I, I, I love this here. You know, it's a, it, the, the, when we come to God, we can keep asking over and over and over. He doesn't get impatient with us like a, like a parent might. Like, uh, like, you've already asked me for this. Stop asking me. Like, no, I've already told you my answer. We'll, we'll never be turned away for asking a stupid question of the Lord. No, he gives wisdom uh, in abundance and invites it over and over and over. There's no reproach with the Lord. There's no like strings attached or, you know, indulgences that must be paid for asking it. There's no like trap doors, no hidden uh, agendas. There's no like going to be like favors asked later. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll give you this, but, uh, but you need to do this for me later. You need to live your whole life for me. No, there's none of that. No scolding, no demeaning, no insulting when we come to the Lord asking for his wisdom. Doesn't this get you excited, church? Like somebody can just give me an amen. Amen, right? And where do we find this wisdom? Well, we find it in his word. Let us ask God. God has given us generosity. He just holds your Bible. Here's 66 books of unlimited treasure for you. As it says in you know, Psalm 19, that, that this is uh, worth more than much fine gold. God has given us wisdom, all that we need, that he will give it without reproach. He's given us complete and full access. You know, when we go to places apart from the word of God, apart from asking God himself, all of those sources are limited. And really, whatever self-discovery you may gain from these outside sources may be helpful, but they will not be transformative. See, the word of God, the wisdom of God, these promises that he's made to us are what transform us. They would actually uh, cure the problem, the, the problem we have of being ignorant or foolish or unknowing, not without understanding. And just like the other sources, you know, they may, they, may re, uh, they, they may reduce the pain. They may plug a hole here. They may uh, reduce the agitation, but they will not cure the problem nor provide the way forward. You know, take, for example, if you have lung cancer. I pray that you never do. But you could take medications to numb the pain. You could take things that would slow the spread you could engage treatments that would alleviate the symptoms. But unless the cancer is removed or your lungs are replaced, there will be no cure. It would just be symptom alleviation. And just like in our problem of foolishness, 
that there's none who does good. We are all depraved. We all have this problem of sin. We all do not know what is true and right unless God gives it to him, and only God can give it. He removes the problem. Hebrews 4 tells us that his word is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. You can turn over in your Bibles for the rest of the quote here. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. He pierces to the division of soul and mar- of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Only God, through his word, by the power of his spirit in your heart, can, can, can remove the problem that we all have, and only God can replace our hearts of stone those hearts that are hardened to the things of God and give us a heart of flesh, as Ezekiel says, a heart that is moldable, transformable in the hands of God. And only God can do this. Only God can transform you. Only God can give wisdom because he is the source of it. And look at here, what he, what he says, and to, to whom does God give wisdom? Like, look in your Bible. He gives generously to what? To all and it will be given him. But verse 6, but let him ask in faith. So to whom does God give wisdom? To all who ask in faith. See, wisdom is available to every believer in abundance without reproach, without fear of scolding or uh, for coming back for more. And so what does this mean? Are you a Christian today? Are you in Christ this morning? Have you repented of your sin? Do you believe that Christ is the only way for you to be saved? Do you believe that Christ is alive today, interceding and working and moving on your behalf? It is grace saved you, that your sins are forgiven because of what Christ did on the cross, that you need not fear death anymore because he is alive. Are you in Christ today? Then you can ask God for this wisdom. It, it, open to you is the divine vault of all infinite wisdom needed for every day, for every decision, for every trial that comes your way. See, God has brought you to this moment and he has also made available to you the wisdom to walk through it. See, that, that, this is not a new situation that we find ourselves in. This pandemic did not catch God off uh, guard like it did for many of us. And he, if he's brought you into the moment, you can be sure that he will give you the tools and the understanding, the wisdom to get through it. And what a gracious God. This is what makes him both sovereign and good. He's in control and he equips us. He hasn't just like, God isn't just up there and like placed us in a situation. He hasn't just like unleashed this thing on the world and now he's just up there kind of malicious. He's like, see, let's see how they're going to deal with this one, you know? He hasn't uh, put you in a position in your family, in your job, and in, in your home. And now he's like, okay, let's see what they're going to do. No, he's put us there. And he's given us the wisdom that we need to get through it. All you need to do, beloved, is ask. Ask. And maybe you're thinking to yourself as talking about this, you're like, but 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 I have asked. I've asked God for wisdom and nothing has changed. I've asked him and I'm still here. I've asked, but you fill in the blank. Well, just as important as who we ask is how we ask for it. We must ask God, but how we ask for it is just as important. So here's the third step in the process. We must accept the answer preemptively. Accept the answer preemptively. See, asking in faith means that we are asking without doubt. And what are we given here in verse 6? We're given this picture of the sea. See, doubt is just like this. Waves are the picture and we're being hit from every direction, upward and sideways. They're being driven and tossed. Maybe you feel like life is like that right now. Being hit from every side. You've got this information, that information. Here's what I want to do. Uh, Here's what this person is telling me to do. And you feel like you're in a wave and you don't know where to go. Have you ever been there? Restless and uneasy? It's no fun, is it? It's no fun. But in faith, 
without doubt, means that we are in Christ. See, we accept the answer preemptively, and what that means is that it's, we come in faith, and this is a part of our standing, not the strength of our faith. See, what he's not referring to here is like, okay, well, you have faith, but, but your doubt makes your faith weak. No, 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 no. He's not talking about the strength of our faith, but our standing in Christ Jesus. See, Proverbs 9, 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you want wisdom? Do you want to know the way forward? Well, it starts by fearing God, of being found in Christ, that believing that, uh, that Christ alone is both the source and the supply of our salvation and of wisdom. See, doubt is uh, indecision. Doubt is, uh, the, is coming and being indecisive, of being flaky, or what uh, the text will go on to say, uh, being unstable. And so, you know, we, we may come and you, to a decision, a fork in the road. We find ourselves being tossed around. We find ourselves being exposed for lacking wisdom. And, and so what do we say in our, you know, pluralistic world? What do we say? Well, we're exploring all our options. Well, I'm, I'm looking at all the scenarios. See, church, when we come to Christ, we are uh, making an exclusive declaration that it is Christ who saves us and it is Christ's way forward that we will follow. Just like when we make a marriage commitment. I've effectively said on the day that I got married 12 years ago now, I made an exclusive commitment to one woman, to Aaron, then Rogers, now Cushman. And my commitment is exclusively to her. And I've said, no other women are on the table. No other relationships are an option for me. There's one woman that is the, uh, that is the object of my desires and affection. There's one woman that I'm committing to for the rest of my days. And similarly, when we come to Christ, we are saying all other options are off the table. All other religions are no longer an option. Christ is the only way for me. And when it comes to following him, when Christ says, follow me, deny yourself, deny everything else, and follow me, there's no more like, well, let's see what Christ has to say about this, and then I'll make my decision. No, 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 no. See, we come to Christ. When we ask him for wisdom, our mind is already made up to accept what he has to say before he even says it, regardless of what it's going to cost us. See, as we ask God, we accept it preemptively because we already believe him. We are already confident in what, we, what, what he's done. This is why we ask God, because he's proven uh, that he's true and right and faithful over and over and over and over again. We, we, we see it all throughout the scriptures. From the very beginning, his way is right. And when we do this, God gets his rightful place. He gets the first and the final say in our lives, and we're okay with that. We're better than that. We're great with that, actually, because we see the protective beauty of God in it. We, it, it boils down to just that, of God's, the protective beauty of God's authority in our life. See, when we humbly submit ourselves to him, when we trust his word, then he leads us in the pathway to wisdom. And he promises it to us. There's no, there's no need to weigh if this is a good or right decision. No, if God says it, if he promises us, if he tells us what to do, we accept it preemptively, knowing that it is going to be the best available option out there. God's ways are always true and right. But when we don't, when we reject it, when we choose the way of foolishness, when we're left to ourselves, when we choose to hack our way out of the information jungle. And we're saying that we prefer to be tossed to and fro. We prefer to be caught up here. But no, rather let us, let us accept the answer preemptively. And here's the final step. Not only do we accept it, but then point number four is we act on it in faith. We act on it rather with faith faith. See, uh, once wisdom is received, once we know what is right and true, no matter what it is, then we act on it with confident dependence upon 
the Lord with that confident, dependent discipline that faith requires. We know what we're going to do. We are going to walk ahead one step at a time. And so who we ask, how we ask for it, and how we act is so important. You know, we may know what is wise, but we won't do it. It's the reason why we have small group ministry. That's why we believe in the power of mutual ministry and the accountability that God's people around us because our problem is not that we don't know what to do so often. It's just that we uh, don't want to do it. We don't act on it in faith. And so in verse 7 here, in, in light of the man who doubts, he says, well, we'd act on it without presumption without these feelings of entitlement that, uh, that make us unstable. See, here's the reality. We don't deserve any of this, do we? We don't de- deserve to hear from God. We don't deserve to be saved, and we don't deserve to have the storehouses of wisdom opened up to us uh, for the taking. He could have just left us to do what is right in our own eyes. He could have just left us to follow after our own sinful inclinations. And just, just read the, the book of Judges this week and see how that goes for people. Read through the, the books of First and Second Kings and see what happens to those that, that do not do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, but do uh, what is right in their own eyes, who follow after the sins of their father. See how things end up for them. That is not the way of wisdom. If you come demanding of the Lord, if you come assuming you're, you're literally outside your mind, you're double-minded or literally double-souled, you're, you're, you're crazy. You come, you know, it's like the, the entitled kid who thinks he deserves more and more and more and more toys. That employee who thinks he deserves the promotion to president after the first week on the job. Now see, entitlement, to, uh, these presumptions, they make us unstable. In all our ways. So when we come uh, doubting, we come indecisive, when we come with this, uh, with this uh, entitled attitude before the Lord, it makes us inconsistent, volatile. You know, it makes us aimless, where we're always wanting to, you know, to move from here to there, where we want to leave our neighborhood because our neighbors you know, have got onto us, where we're switching jobs all the time, where we, where, we, where we can't stay steady and still because we lack wisdom. You know, where we erupt in fits. But see, faith, humility, stabilizes us. Makes us steadfast. Makes us uh, committed and loyal, just like the God of the universe. God who is unconditional in his love. God who is steadfast in his love. Enables us to uh, be stabilized in such a way where the only erupting we do is in praise and in worship of our God. See, the kind of faith that receives wisdom from God is confident and dependent on Christ with wisdom. We come asking for it, knowing that God will give it. We come asking in faith. We come ready to act no matter what it is. We come searching with willing, obedient hearts. And then with the confidence and the discipline to put it into action. And so I ask you this morning, what is it that you need wisdom for right now? Where do you lack wisdom? Have you acknowledged it? Have you told the Lord this? In a minute, we're going to spend some time praying to where you can just acknowledge where you lack right before the Lord. Maybe it's at work. Maybe you're wondering what what to do right now. Maybe your hours are being cut. Maybe you've lost your job entirely. Maybe you're having to make some hard decisions that will affect the jobs of some other people. Maybe you're trying to adapt to these changing times and you lack wisdom. Maybe you lack wisdom financially and things are tight. Maybe you've, maybe you've gotten a stimulus check. Maybe you're on the other side and you're like, well, what do I, what do, I do with it? How do I multiply this for the kingdom? How, do, how can I bless somebody else? Do I save it? Do I spend it right now? What are we to do with it? Maybe you lack wisdom in school. Maybe you're a parent right now who's schooling your child online and there's all kinds of decisions having to be made. And do we, how, do, how are we going to make it the rest of the school year now that you know, the kids aren't going back to school? Maybe you're uh, in that boat of asking questions about where, where do you continue your education? Maybe it's in your marriage. 
This pandemic has exposed some things about your own soul, your own attitude, your own affections towards your husband or wife. Maybe you're wondering, okay, well, how, do I, how, how can I love my wife right now? You lack wisdom in it. Where are you asking? Where are you getting your help from? Maybe it's a parenting question or something in your friendship. Maybe it's a health-related issue. You're having to make some hard decisions about what is right. What treatment options do we decide upon? Maybe you're having to make that decision for somebody else, an aging parent, uh, you know, a child, your spouse. Who are you asking for wisdom? Where are you searching for? Are you asking God? See, what does he do? He, he promises wisdom to you overflowing in every situation. He's given you many channels to ask him. He's given you his word before you, his spirit inside you, the, the church around you. Even the limitations and the restrictions of our gathering won't stop these three uh, channels of wisdom, of the voice of God in your life. Oh, redemption, let us ask and ask and ask for some more for this wisdom to the praise of his glory that our steps may be on rock-solid ground, that the pathway through the jungle is clear before us. Hear these words in conclusion from Jesus, from Matthew chapter 7. He told us this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? It's Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Would you pray with me now to this end? God in heaven, we, we, we just stand in awe now. Recognizing uh, two things, that you are the source and the supply of all wisdom. That you know what is true and what is right. And secondly, we uh, recognize this morning, God, that we lack wisdom. And so we're here right now, just God, to ask you for what is true and right for that understanding that we might apply it in the days ahead. And so God, hear, hear the prayers of your people now as they fill in the blank to this question. God, I need wisdom for blank. God, we are just taking you at your word that you will give it generously and without reproach. Some of your children have asked for this very thing over and over and over and over again. Time and situation uh, over again. And so we're just asking you this morning, God. We want to be wise. We want to follow your ways. And so here we are. We stand ready. We stand obedient. We stand faithful, God. Not wanting to be tossed anymore. Not wanting to be unstable anymore, but with eyes set on you, feet firmly fixed in faith, ready to follow you this morning. Thank you, God, for this promise. We pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, church, let's walk this week uh, in light of the wisdom that God has promised to give us. You know, there are many opportunities as God is at work in your life and through our church to continue to put into practice our, our faith this week. And so um, uh, let us uh, not just be hearers of the word this morning, like James uh, warns, but be doers also. And let us walk the way of wisdom uh, even uh, the rest of this day and the remainder of this week. Hear these words as the way Psalm 111 ends. It says this, He sent redemption to his people in the person of Jesus Christ. That is. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. 
His praise endures forever. What great words and what a great way to end our service this morning. Hey church, you are missed, you are loved. We'll see you soon.